birds of fields, forests, and shrublands, encouraging wildlife diversity via habitat diversity. In this presentation, I'll discuss the different bird species associated with our most common upland habitat types in New Hampshire, fields, forests, and shrublands. I'll also provide a quick overview of the typical ways we manage these habitats to support a diversity of bird and other wildlife species. I'll discuss field habitats first, and we'll begin with just a basic definition of the habitat conditions that function as field habitat for wildlife. Fields can be recognized as upland or non-wetland openings that are dominated by herbaceous, non-woody plants. And these habitats contain few or no trees or shrubs. As a wildlife biologist, I distinguish different fields based on how they function as wildlife habitat. As habitat, fields can be grouped into one of two primary types in New Hampshire, fields that function as grassland habitat and all other fields. I'll first discuss the grassland habitats. Think of grassland habitats as large fields, fields that are at least five acres, but ideally greater than 30 acres in size. These large fields are required nesting habitat for a small number of grassland dependent birds that we refer to simply as the grassland birds. Populations of these birds are declining dramatically throughout their range, but especially here in New England, primarily as a result of habitat loss. The two grassland bird species that are most likely to occur on lands owned by private landowners or communities are the bobolink and the savanna sparrow. Bobolinks require fields at least five to 10 acres in size for nesting, and savanna sparrows rarely nest in fields less than 20 acres. Populations of these two species are declining rapidly, but they still occur pretty predictably in most grassland habitats of these sizes in New Hampshire. Two additional grassland bird species you might encounter are the eastern meadowlark and the grasshopper sparrow. These birds rarely occur in grasslands less than 30 acres, and they are becoming quite rare. Both are listed as threatened species in New Hampshire. To function as habitat for the grassland birds, a field not only has to be large, but it must also be very open. And very open means there should be no trees or shrubs growing within the field, and the field should be wide, not narrow. So think blocky square or rectangular fields, not long and narrow fields. For example, here's a field that's large enough to be a grassland, but it's too narrow to expect it to function as a grassland. The reason it's too narrow is because grassland birds typically avoid nesting in fields where the field edges are close to the center of the field. And this is because grassland birds prefer to nest as far away from field edges as possible. They make their nests directly on the ground and this makes them especially vulnerable to predators that hunt along field edges. So these birds tend to only nest in large fields and they tend to locate their nests near the center of these fields. Grassland birds are nesting and raising their young between about mid-May through the end of July. Fields that we manage as nesting habitat for grassland birds should be mowed once each year, no earlier than August 1st, and ideally the cut grass should be removed. This yearly mowing keeps the fields dominated by grasses rather than allowing wildflowers and young shrubs to grow up in the field. Mowing after August 1st is late enough that nests and fledgling birds won't get destroyed by mowing equipment. I consider all fields that are unlikely to function as nesting habitat for grassland birds as other fields. These include any fields less than five acres in size, fields of any size that have trees or shrubs growing within the opening of the field, and fields that are long and narrow are those that are irregular in shape with peninsulas of trees that extend towards the center of the field. These fields don't provide grassland birds with an area to nest away from the field edge. In any field where we are not trying to maintain nesting habitat for grassland birds, the habitat goal is usually to have the field support the greatest variety of wildlife as possible. The best way to do that is to allow wildflowers to grow up within the field. 
This is accomplished most easily by reducing how frequently the field is mowed. Mowing only once every two to three years allows a variety of flowering plants to grow up naturally into a field, but this frequency of mowing usually keeps a field from reverting to shrubs. A way to further enhance habitat diversity is to divide a field into sections and then mow the different sections in different years so that you never mow the entire field all at once. Here, the recently mowed short grass areas provide ideal foraging habitat for American robins, morning doves, chipping sparrows, and northern flickers. And in large openings, short grass areas may provide hunting habitat for American kestrels and red-tailed hawks. The areas that are left unmowed provide numerous habitat benefits, including providing a diversity of flowering plants to support pollinating insects. And greater insect abundance improves foraging habitat for eastern bluebirds, swallows, eastern phoebes, and even bats. Flower seed heads provide important fall food for American goldfinches and winter food for dark-eyed juncos and common red poles. Many pollinators also lay their eggs in flower stems, so leaving these unmowed supports healthy pollinator populations. The tall grass and wildflowers provide nesting cover for wild turkeys, fawning cover for deer, and summer cover for turtles. The tall grass areas also will develop a thatch layer of dead grass that provides ideal cover for small mammals and snakes, which provide important food for foxes, hawks, and owls. Now there's all sorts of ways you might divide a field into sections, but usually I set up a mowing rotation so that only one section gets mowed each year and every section gets mowed once about every two to four years. Fields that are mowed less frequently, like once only every five or so years, tend to get shrubby. And we see a huge increase in the number of wildlife species that will use a field once the field gets really shrubby around the point when shrubs start to cover at least 30% of a field. At this point, our field is no longer considered field habitat, it's now shrubland, because it now supports wildlife species that require shrubland habitats. So what defines a shrubland habitat? Well, shrublands are upland openings that are usually dominated by a combination of shrubs, tree saplings, grasses, wildflowers, and ferns and there are few or no overstory trees. If there are trees, they are spaced widely enough to not inhibit sunlight from reaching the shrubs. Shrublands go by a variety of different names, including early successional habitat, young forest, and thickets. These are all shrublands. In New Hampshire, we have about 36 species of birds that require shrublands as their primary nesting and foraging habitat. These include prairie warblers, brown thrashers, chestnut-sided warblers, indigo buntings, field sparrows, blue wing warblers, eastern towhees, and alder flycatchers. Collectively, we refer to these 36 species as the shrubland birds. These birds require shrublands for the specific habitat structure that provides them with cover for nesting and perches for singing, abundant insects for raising their young, and abundant fruits for raising their young and preparing for migration. Although there are a few shrubland birds, including cardinals, Carolina wrens, northern mockingbirds, and song sparrows that are commonly observed around yards where there are shrubby edges, Many shrubland birds are uncommon in shrublands less than about two acres in size, and for most species, shrublands greater than five acres likely provide them with the best breeding habitat. Historically, large shrubland habitats occurred in unique communities such as pitch pine scrub oak barrens, on rocky ridge tops, and in coastal dunes. They were also created in other areas by periodic natural disturbances such as large wind and ice storms. All of these types of shrubland habitats are very uncommon today, and as a result, populations of many shrubland birds are declining dramatically. In most landscapes today, shrubland birds rely on human-created shrublands as their primary habitat. Today, some of the most important shrubland habitats in New Hampshire include transmission line rights away that are maintained in a shrubby condition by electric companies, active in abandoned gravel pits, which tend to stay shrubby due to harsh growing conditions, shrubby old fields, 
and large young forest openings created via timber harvesting. Creating shrubby old fields is accomplished by simply allowing shrubs and saplings to grow up into a field naturally. Once shrubs are established, you don't really need to ever cut the shrub species but eventually you'll need to periodically cut individual trees that begin to overtop and shade out the shrubs. In a small shrubland, this can be done using a chainsaw or brush saw, which is basically a weed whacker with a saw blade. You basically schedule one day or weekend each year to cut out all of the tallest saplings. In larger openings, we typically use a brontosaurus or a Reiko style forestry mower to mow the trees about once every seven to 10 years. This opening in the photo was mowed flat because it was an overgrown clear cut that was all tree stump sprouts and few shrub species. But usually we have these mowers mow around any shrubs. Habitat biologists and foresters also regularly use clear cutting as a tool to convert specific forested areas into shrubby habitats. In this photo is a 25 acre clear cut made on the Londonderry Town Forest, specifically for New England cottontails, but it currently supports all of the shrubland birds that would be expected here. This area was cut using whole tree logging equipment. The area was allowed to regenerate naturally, and then half of the clear cut was cut again with a brontosaurus to keep it shrubby. Big openings like this are super valuable habitat for shrubland dependent wildlife, but these openings need to be planned carefully because in many areas of New Hampshire, especially in the South, Creating large clear cuts may result in a significant loss of mature forest habitat, primarily because many of our landscapes are already heavily fragmented by development. In the next slide, I'm going to zoom into this area right here. The area outlined here in yellow is that 25 acre clear cut on the Londonderry Town Forest, and it was located very strategically, nestled near the junction of two transmission line rights away, and it is near a very large gravel pit here to the west. Here, smaller clear cuts have been made more recently to create additional shrubland habitat as the older clear cut matures. Combined, these clear cuts, the rights away, and the gravel pit provide an ideal complex of shrubland habitat in close proximity to one another, which allows birds to regularly fly among these openings. But note that these large clear cuts were clustered together and located on the edge of, not in the center of, these big blocks of mature forest habitat. Timber harvesting is conducted in these blocks of mature forest, but here trees are removed as individual trees or in very small groups with the specific intent of maintaining mature forest structure, tree health and diversity, and seed production for wildlife. This is important because here in New Hampshire, we have about 34 species of birds that require mature forest as their primary nesting habitat. These include the scarlet tanagers, wood thrush and oven birds, black-throated blue and black-throated green warblers, black Bernian warblers, blue-headed vireos, and raptors that include the northern goshawk and barred owl. Many of these birds forage in shrublands and in wetland openings during the breeding season and during migration, but they all require large stands of mature forest for nesting. I call these the mature forest birds. Mature forest birds regularly occur in habitats where mature trees create a forest canopy that is over 30% closed, meaning that when you are in the forest and look up, over 30% of the sky will be blocked by the foliage of mature trees. Most species of mature forest birds prefer to nest where the canopy is over 60% closed. And while you can find these birds in small forest fragments, most prefer to nest in blocks of forest greater than 100 acres because large blocks have more interior space away from the forest edges where the risk of nest predation and nest parasitism by cowbirds can be high. So there's a lot of different species of forest birds and each species has its own requirements for the specific forest types and conditions that it prefers or requires. Overall, what forest birds occur within an area is influenced by the forest type, meaning whether the forest is dominated by hardwood trees, softwood trees, or a mixture of hardwoods and softwoods. 
What birds occur is also determined by the forest structure, such as the presence and absence of different canopy, midstory, and shrub layers, and by the presence or absence of special habitat features. The presence or absence and density of forest layers determines what birds will use a forest as habitat. Landscapes composed of different forests that vary in their structure are most likely to support a diversity of mature forest bird species. Foresters and wildlife biologists use commercial timber harvesting as the primary tool for enhancing and maintaining diverse forest structure within mature forest habitats. When we are managing mature forests for birds, we want to maintain a relatively intact overstory, but in some areas we remove individual trees or small groups of trees to establish and maintain diverse midstory and shrub layer structure. When timber harvesting, we try to retain any dead standing trees and any live trees with visible cavities to maintain required nesting and foraging habitat for birds and other wildlife. Trees of different sizes accommodate different wildlife species, so it's best to retain trees of a variety of sizes across a landscape. One of the best ways to encourage and maintain a diversity of birds and other wildlife is to encourage and maintain a diversity of tree and shrub species that together produce a variety of seeds, nuts, and berries. We often use timber harvesting to remove trees that overtop berry producing shrubs to provide the shrubs with the sunlight energy they need to produce good fruit crops. We also use timber harvesting to make openings in the canopy around healthy trees like mature oaks so that those trees can expand their crowns to capture more sunlight and produce larger acorn crops. In most communities in New Hampshire, similar to the town of Newmarket shown here as an example, there's lots of opportunities for private landowners and communities to maintain a healthy diversity of field, shrubland, forest, and wetland habitats. But in many areas, particularly where development pressure is high, there can be lots of challenges too. So if you're interested in learning more about how to conserve and manage wildlife habitats, be sure to get assistance from professional wildlife biologists and foresters so we can help you with your efforts. Your first and easiest step is always to call your county cooperative extension forester. UNH Cooperative Extension has county foresters working in all 10 counties. Our county and state specialists work in close cooperation with the New Hampshire Division of Forests and Lands, New Hampshire Fish and Game Department, and the Natural Resources Conservation Service to help guide you through the steps of managing and conserving natural resources. This presentation was developed by Matt Tarr, Extension Professor, Wildlife Specialist with the University of New Hampshire Cooperative Extension. Please don't hesitate to contact Matt directly if you have any questions or comments about this presentation or would like more information about how to steward wildlife habitats on your land.